Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another general interest Sharknet seminar. The topic today is high performance computing with Python. My, my name is Pavel Gomorski and I am with Sharknet based at the University of Waterloo. And there's uh, my email, so if you have any questions that come to your mind after this talk is over, you can contact me directly. So uh, in outline, what I hope you get out of this seminar is you get some idea how to speed up your code, your Python code with NumPy, with Cython and using MPI via the MPI 4PY module. Now, one hour is not sufficient to do this topic justice, so I warmly invite you to our uh, yearly summer school. The next one will be held on May 25th, 29th, where the material in this uh, seminar will be covered in much greater depth. For this seminar, I have to assume that you have at least a little bit of familiarity with C, with Python, and with MPI. There's just no way to introduce these topics fully, so I hope you can bear with me. So what is Python? Hopefully uh, most of you know, but let me just uh, refresh your memory if you don't. Python is a programming language that appeared in 1991, and uh, you can compare its age with Fortran, which came in 1957, C, with, which came in 1972, and C++, which came in 1983. So Python is a much newer language, and it has some more modern features, as we will see. And while the older languages still dominate high-performance com computing, the popularity of Python is strongly growing, as the number of people attending this talk shows. It's greater than average, I would say. So what are the Python advantages? Uh, Python has been designed from the start for better code readability. It allows expression of concepts in fewer lines of code. It has a dynamic type system so that you, know, you don't have to declare every single variable like you do in Fortran and C, which makes your life much easier. It has automatic memory management, so you don't have to allocate the allocate memory, something that is easy to mishandle in, in a code like C. And uh, very importantly, it has a large number of easily accessible and extensive libraries. So for example, NumPy and SciPy. So as we will see, these are very useful. So all these features makes developing new codes quite easier, which for scientists, it's quite important. You want to develop code quickly and get your results fast. But there's disadvantages. There are disadvantages. So the main one is that Python is generally slower than compiled languages like C, C++, and Fortran. And I cannot go here into the technical side of why that is so, except to say that uh, the main reason is that Python is an interpreted language, so it's not compiled like C and C++. Also, it has dynamic typing, which means that your computer doesn't know ahead of time what the value of a variable will be, whether it will be an integer or a float, or, and so on. Whereas a compiler, once it compiles the code, knows this and can make your code faster. Now, uh, Speed will not matter much on a small desktop program. So if you are analyzing your data with Python and making some nice plots, if it takes 0.1 seconds to run or one second to run, you're not really going to see that much of a difference. This is fine. But on the other hand, in a high performance computing environment, whether your program takes one day to run or 10 days to run makes a huge difference. So we really, uh, so the fact that Python is somewhat slower is a much greater con concern in HPC, high performance computing environments. A another concern which makes Python slightly disadvantageous is that it is newer in the HPC field. So I would say there isn't you know, that much resources online describing how to use, for example, NPI with Python compared to how many there are for C and uh, Fortran. Although that is changing. There's more and more material on how to run Python in parallel. So the rest of this talk will describe approaches which would ensure how to get, you know, that your Python code runs reasonably fast and also in parallel. So I will start with one simple example. It's kind of a canonical example for this kind of work. Let's look at the one-dimensional diffusion equation uh, stated there. And uh, this is, uh, you know, the typical equation which describes the evolution of some quantity over time, some quantity distributed in space. Here we have a one-dimensional problem. So in particular, we want to start with some initial condition. Let's say we know what the function u is as a function of x at time zero, and we want to determine uh, what the function u looks as a function of uh, x at some future time t. So in this very simple example, I will use the, the simplest method possible, which is a finite difference method with you know Euler method for time evolution. 
This is not a particularly good method, but I'm just using it for illustrative purposes. And you can see here that with finite differencing, we take a continuous function and we describe its values on a grid, so it's an approximation. And uh, we can compute the uh, value at the next time step, at the m plus one time step, by using only the values at the previous time step, where here we have, uh, where the change proportional to delta t is uh, the Laplacian, which the Laplacian is given here. And uh, hopefully you have all seen this kind of finite difference scheme before, so I will not spend uh, more time discussing it. And uh, in the code which follows for simplicity, I will have assumed that delta t and delta x is one, so I only have the constant kappa in my code. So uh, how would I implement this algorithm in C code, just using standard C? Well, here it is. So I define uh, my arrays x, u, and u dt. So uh, I first impose some initial condition, which in my case is just uh, Gaussian. I impose it using a loop, and I so I have to keep the value at the current time step and the value at the next time step that has to be stored. So I initialize the current time step value and I just set the other one to zero that will be changed very soon. My kappa value is you know, something that, that gives a stable solution, 0 0.1. And, uh, and here's the loop. So I just uh, do as many iterations as I want. And for each iteration, I first apply the Euler scheme to compute the value of u, u dt, at the next time step from the current one. And after this loop is done, I then have to move the data from the next time step array back to my current time step array. So very simple. This is not meant to be particularly efficient. One could do this better. For example, the value of uh, u at i is occurring twice. One could uh, bring these together. but for demonstrative purposes, this is good enough. So this is my C code, and it doesn't look that complicated, and that it was relatively easy to write. Just to give you an illustration, what this code actually does is here's the evolution U of X after 50,000 time steps. So I start off with the blue line, which is just a Gaussian, and the red line is how this evolved after 50,000 time steps. So you can imagine that uh, if you want a direct analogy, that this is a, some kind of a heat spike, a spike in temperature, which then cools off and spreads out as time evolves. And notice here, in the, my x-axis is actually quite huge, so this spike is pretty narrow. I simply picked a huge axis to have a relatively large array, which is sort of more numerically relevant. So let's say I want to write, rewrite the same code in Python. So for this, the first thing I will need is I will need numerical arrays. And these are not provided in Python by default. One can make arrays as lists, but it's highly inefficient. So NumPy is a very standard extension which provides arrays with its functionality. And along with SciPy, these, these two libraries provide a wide range of tools which make Python so attractive to the scientific community. So uh, what I have done here is I have written the so-called vanilla Python code. Vanilla means just very basic with uh, you know, minimal insight into how to make it uh, faster. So in analogy with C code, I now have to allocate my x, u, and u, d, t arrays. So I do this here. I am not using the array x, by the way, but I will be using it shortly. So uh, in NumPy, you can create an array with, uh, you can specify how long the array is, how many entries it has, and the data type that you want it to be in. Here I picked double, double precision, float 64. So this is somewhat like a definition in C. So NumPy does require you to define some arrays, but it's reasonable. I mean, it, the, the compiler just has to know what your data looks like before it can work with it. So now I initialize uh, this array U of I, and uh, in analogy of C code, I just have a loop where in Python where I initialize this array. And here I have a time evolution where in complete analogy with my C code, I have a loop over iterations. And then for each iteration, I have loop over I to update UDT. And then after UDT is updated, I have another loop to update U. So this is the vanilla Python code. And not surprisingly, 
I'm not encouraging you, to, encouraging you to use this because this code does quite badly. So on my laptop, I did only 500 iterations, and uh, with C code compiled with GCC, that took only 0.21 seconds, whereas this Python vanilla code took as long as 64.70 seconds. So it's slower by a factor of 300, which is huge. So we are using NumPy, so we are using the efficient arrays, but we are not using them efficiently because we are looping over them explicitly. We must use NumPy operations instead to somehow eliminate the loop. Now in this example, as we will see, eliminating the loop is quite simple. In some other more complicated examples, you might think of this might not be that trivial at all. So the goal of showing you this code is that unfortunately, if you just write a Python code using explicit loops without thinking too much about it, it's gonna be drastically slow than any, any C code you write. So it's really important before you try to use your Python code in any, for any calculations which demand numerical efficiency, you have to just make sure that it runs well on a single processor. Okay, so now let's move on to fixing the code we just wrote, which is quite so bad. So uh, we have to eliminate the loop, and we eliminate the loop by using the functionality of NumPy arrays and particular slicing. So here's a screenshot of uh, what I did in my Python interpreter. This is, by the way, another nice feature of Python is not only is it a programming language, but it comes with an interpreter, so you can work with it interactively. So in this case, uh, I define my array A, which just holds numbers from zero to nine, and here I print it out. And uh, now I can slice it. So in uh, NumPy, slicing means looking at subsections of the array. So for example, let's say that I want to look at the entries of this array, but without the initial member and the final member. So this slicing accomplishes this. So now I have, uh, now instead of from zero to nine, I have from one to eight. I can do another slicing. So I can slice from zero to seven. So starting from the initial entry, but excluding the two final entries. And here's its slice. And now I can combine these slices. So as you can see that uh, I have now one plus zero is one, correct. Two plus one is three, correct. Three plus two is five, correct. So I have taken my initial array. Now I can take it and add it to this array, but shift it by one and get another array. So this is how slicing and slicing operation works. So let's take a look what this does to my loop. So uh, in the first uh, code example, I have the explicit loop. And now this slicing replaces that loop and it does exactly what the loop does. So I hope by looking at this for a, for a moment, you can convince yourself that it succeeds. And this means that I have now eliminated an explicit loop and I let Python handle the looping. So, I mean, rather NumPy handle the looping. So NumPy, which is using highly efficient numerical uh, libraries underneath, will actually do the loop efficiently using its this slicing notation. So let's now look at what the code looks like when we use slicing. So I just took what I showed you in the previous slide and I have inserted that in the iteration. I have also done one more trick. I have eliminated the loop to uh, initialize the function. Now, that is executed only once, so it doesn't really matter that much if it's slow, but we might as well get rid of that loop as well. So here I'm showing you an example of how to apply a function to a whole array. In this case, I have to actually provide the x values. So x values are defined here. And then I define a function, which function of x via the lambda notation. And then I call this initialization function on x and this produces u, which gives me the initial condition. Now UDT is set to zero. So this is this semicolon in the middle just means set all the entries of U to zero. And here I still have a for loop. I still have an iterative loop, but that one is okay because we are just, uh, th this is a relatively low intensity loop where we are looping over a very large operation. So this one we can leave in. Okay, so let's look at the performance of this much improved code. So now I have, I have gone from 500 iterations to 50,000 to actually get some meaningful time evolution. And C code compiled with, optim with optimization, so with GCC-02, did this in 12.75 seconds. Python did this with number operations in 40.43 seconds. So Python was 3.2 times slower than optimized code. 
This is not great, but it's in a completely different league than being a factor of 300 slower, right? And uh, why is it slower nevertheless? Well, we can compare it to unoptimized C. So if we don't optimize C, so if we just run GCC with the dash all flag, uh, the time that GCC takes is actually comparable to NumPy. So this seems to suggest that, you know, G that C can actually optimize between the iterations, whereas in NumPy, each iteration is taken individually. So NumPy does with it what it can, but it just is not aware of the other iterations, so it cannot optimize them together where C can. So the moral of this story is whether the factor of three is slower, this is an issue for the programmer. If you really, really, really care about performance only, then factor of three is going to look horrible and you will say, okay, I really have to write my code and see. On the other hand, if you're a scientist where you're doing a lot of development and it really matters for you that you get your code written in one week instead of three weeks, then maybe the speed boost you get with Python is so beneficial to you that you will take a three times slower performance penalty. Now, I have to stress that this is just one example code which gives you one example of behavior. There's definitely Python codes which are more efficient than this. In particular, if you are calling, if you are doing operations like matrix multiplications of large matrices and things like that, then when you call a NumPy function to, let's say, do this matrix multiplication, that will actually invoke the underlying numerical library to perform this large operation. And the speed of this will be just the same as the speed of, uh, you know, doing, invoking this library in C because it's just calling the same library. So th this, uh, the degree of uh, how much your code slows down will really vary. This is one ballpark figure, but I hope it gives you some idea of what to expect. So again, we have to stress then that you cannot have explicit loops in Python. They are just no, no, you have to, one, one way around it, so you have to use NumPy arrays. Okay, but uh, not all problems fit this approach. I mean, some problems just, you know, they don't involve large arrays, and uh, so the array operations on those will not help you much. So let's look at some more general techniques to speed up Python code. So as I indicated before, Python is not a compiled language, so one way of thinking how to speed it up is maybe let's try to compile. So uh, there's very active development uh, going on in these areas. And I can only, in this short talk, I can only talk about one of them. There is a general compiler. This is something very fresh and it's still under development. It's called Noitka. And this is the web address. So this is actually an approach where you take your Python code, you just compile it and you run it. And no change to the code needs to be made and it looks very promising. Then there is PyPy, and that's the web address there. This is a just-in-time compiler. So this is an implementation of Python which tries to compile code as you run it. I will not discuss it in this talk, but it's another approach. And finally, what I will discuss is Cython. So this is a tool which allows you to turn your Python program into C code and compile it. And this results in faster running code. And you will see how that works shortly. So I, I have to pick another example problem for this. And here I have chosen one of the Project Euler problems. This is an interesting website which has a large number of mathematically oriented problems. And the problem here is if P is the perimeter of the right angle triangle with integral length and sides ABC, then for some value of P, which is the perimeter, so sum of A, B, and C, there's exactly three solutions and they are given there. So the question is for which value of P less than N is the number of solutions maximized? Sorry, there should be a less than sign there. It's, it's not showing up in my slide for some reason. And uh, in, in the Euler example, they take N equals 1000 as a starting point, but you can of course increase it to make your calculation longer. So this is really a toy problem. It's not a, of scientific interest, but it, the nice thing is that it does become quite numerically intensive as you increase N. So, you know, you can always ramp it up to make it computationally challenging. So uh, how do we solve this problem? Well, we need some kind of a function which, given the parameter, computes the total number of integral solutions, so triangles of sides A, B, and C, right angle triangles of sides A, A B, and C uh, of parameter P, 
And uh, here I just take a brute force approach. This is not meant to be particularly numerically efficient, but it is mathematically correct, where I have an explicit loop over A, B, of course, once I know A and B, then C is just P minus A minus B. Here I have a sanity check just to make sure that C is greater than zero, so we don't have negative triangle sides. And then if the condition holds, so if A squared plus B squared is C squared, then I increment my number of solutions, and then I have I have, I have, after I have done checking all the possibilities, I have, I return n. So this is my function. And then I just do a brute search. Again, this is not meant, not meant to be particularly intelligent or efficient. So I just uh, look at the value of the perimeter from one to whatever is my limit. And I call a fine number of solutions for each value. And then whenever I find that that number is greater than my latest maximum, I update the maximum and I update which value the maximum occurred is. And after I look this whole thing, I just print out what is the maximum value at the end. So very straightforward. So as we can already predict, this is going to be slow, right? Because I have explicit loops. So uh, how do I make it faster? So the, uh, the Python approach is to identify the functions in the code where it spends the most time. So of course, in my code, it's there's only one function, so we know it's going to spend the most time in fine num solutions. But in a general code, you would identify which functions are really costly in terms of computation. You would then place those functions in a separate file, so they are imported as a module into your Python code. Then Cython will take this uh, Python module file, convert it into C code, and compile it into a shared library. This shared library will then be imported by Python at runtime just like it would import a standard Python module. And uh, to make this work well, we actually need to give Cython some hints as to what the variables are by defining some key variables. So, uh, so th these are just some details of how Cython is invoked. So uh, you know, bear with me. You can always look at the Cython tutorial page to remind yourself that you forget. So in my case, I would take my find num solutions code and I would place it in a file called PYX. So PYX is the, the file which Cython takes as input. As input, it's not a .py file because it, it has some extensions to Python which Cython will use. Then I have to create a setup.py file. So this is just, uh, it's fairly standard, just a set of instructions for how Cython should build this module. So here's the file name. Uh, for Cython to work, it has to import the Cython module clearly. So that has to be installed with your Python for this approach to work. After you have uh, modified your .p .pyx file and edited your setup.py, you run this. And this is basically the compiling step. This, this will take find num solutions and make C code out of it. So it actually translates your Python code into C code. Now you can look inside this file. Unfortunately, it's not very informative because it, there's a lot of convoluted syntax there. but it is created, and then this uh, .c file is just created, is just compiled into a numer into an executable, which looks like any other C compiled executable, and you can uh, call this at runtime. So, what do I actually have to do to my find num solutions file? Which hints, which hints do I have to give to Cython? Well, in this case, the essential hint is I have to tell it that a, b, c, n, and p are integers. And we will see that just letting Cypher know, know that this is true will make all the difference in the world. Now, why is this important? Python doesn't have variable declarations. So if you don't put integer p there, Python has to assume that p could be anything. It could be a float, it could be a string, who knows? And it, it simply cannot make this code any more efficient because it doesn't know what the input is. So here I'm telling it that only integers will be accepted as input and only, and then, a, B, C, and N are integers. Uh, so one has to note, of course, that now this imposes a certain burden on me as a programmer because I really should not be calling fight num solutions in my main code and giving it anything but an integer. So this is something to be aware of. So I take this code with, with these modifications and I put it in file find num solutions dot pyx. And uh, now this is my main code, so the code which loops over find num solutions, and here the differences are really minor. I have to import the find num solutions module to get this function, but 
it's just a standard import, just like you would import any other Python module. And then when I call it, I have to just, you know, have find none solutions dot, this is the name of the module, and then this is the name of the function. But other than that, the main code hasn't really changed much at all. At all. So once I compile this uh, Python module, I can just use it as I would use any other Python module. So now let's take a look at the, take a look at the speed up. So vanilla Python, for this code, for the case n equals 1000, runs in 38.324 seconds. Now, if I take Cypher without any variable definition, so if I don't add the, the CDEF statements, it is already a little bit faster, which is sort of interesting. So you get this speed up for free. So just by feeding your code into Cypher and converting it into C without any hints, you already get a little bit of a speed up. But you get a huge speed up, a factor of 92 speed up once you told Cypher that P and other variables are integers. So just by adding these, uh, just by saying that this is an integer and then defining A, B, and C as integers, which really isn't that much work, and I haven't gotten rid of the loops, I just indicated these variables are integers, this allowed Cyton to be smart enough to give me a factor of 92 speed up, which is quite good. So uh, the lesson of this is definitely Anytime you're writing a Python code and you are thinking of, uh, you know, making this into HPC code, which you will run on the clusters, if you cannot use NumPy, uh, you should definitely try to find places where you can speed up your code with Cython. So look for the functions which are numerically intensive and uh, try to introduce some uh, Cython hints and then use Cython to make them faster. And by the way, Cyton can be mixed with NumPy as well. So if you, if part of your code is accelerated with NumPy and part of your code is accelerated, made faster with Cyton, that's definitely fine. Okay, so at this point, let's say that you have made your Python serial code efficient. It's running relatively fast. And now you want to parallelize it. So uh, one promising approach would seem to be threading. Uh, Python, if you look at manuals for Python, you have uh, threading modules, but there's a major problem for high performance computing with threading. And this is the global interpreter lock. So this is a mechanism in, we, in which when you have threads within Python, even though you have many threads, only one of them can execute at one time. This is something built into the interpreter. There's just no way around it. The reason this is there is that it improves reliability. If only one thread at a time is executing, there are some bugs and you know, race conditions which will not occur. So from the viewpoint of making Python more reliable, this is a good thing. But from the viewpoint of high performance computing, it's a horrible thing because the whole point of threads is that you want to have multiple threads running at the same time. And this is precisely what Python forbids. So the threading approach is sort of hopeless, and so we just uh, have to stay away from it. So what we have to do is we have to use multiple processes instead. So Python has some mechanisms already built in to do that, but the mechanism which high-performance computing uh, programmers who are familiar with high-performance computing already know is MPI, and MPI is a multiple, multiple process approach. So this is what I will focus on here. So uh, MPI stands for messages, message passing interface. Now this is a huge subject. So here I, I, I'm sort of assuming that people have seen this before in a non-Python context. If you have not seen this, I can only hope that you attend our summer school in May where we have two solid days just talking about MPI and it's a great uh, technique to learn. So with the MPI approach, uh, you, uh, the program when it's running has access to multiple, pro multiple processors with independent memory. So you have multiple processes, each one with its own memory region running in parallel. Now the memory is not shared between these processes. So the data has to be exchanged via calls to MPI routine. So each process is running the same code. So they all start up running the same code but the MPI environment allows each process to identify itself. Let's say when you have eight processes, one of them will be process zero, another will be process one, process two, and so on. And even though they are running the same code, 
process zero, there can be something in the code which specifies if you are process zero, run this this if if statement. If you are process one, run this if statement, and so on. So even though the even though the, the source code is the same, the executable actually diverges as it runs. So then there is the uh, Python way of doing MPI, and this uh, comes through MPI for PY, which is a Python uh, module. And uh, I guess the best way to illustrate things is just to show you side by side what a C code would look like and what an MPI code would look like. So these are complete codes, and uh, they both do something very simple. They just do a reduction operation. So in this case, a reduction operation in this case is uh, each process has some value imax underscore n, where this value is just the rank of the process. So process, for process 0, this will be 0. For process 1, this will be 1. For process 2, this will be 2. And then I call a reduction operation where each process supplies its value and a maximum value among all of these is found and it's stored on process zero. So, and then process zero just prints the value. So uh, the way this would work is if let's say I'm running with four processes, then the values of my rank would be zero, one, two, three. So when the reduction is done, process zero would end up with number three and would print it out. Uh, so looking at these two languages, you can see, of course, that C is quite complex, as you would expect C to be. So you have to worry about the variable declarations, clearly. There's none of those in Python. You have to worry about pointers. Notice that here the arguments for all these functions have to have the ampersand operator to provide a pointer to my rank, pointer to IMAX, and so on. And uh, so most of the other things are the same. So we have some initialization statement. We have a get rank statement to get the process ID. And here's the reduce statement. But notice that the reduce, uh, the reduce call in Python is quite simpler because, first of all, there's a return, which com.reduce gives. And the return is the final answer. So this is the maximum among all the input values. This is not something which uh, MPI reduce has in C. There you have to actually provide a buffer argument for the input and the output. And uh, you have to remember what order they are in and so on, which is kind of, can be confusing. But there's also these other things. So here in MPI, in the C version, you have to say that you're sending one number of type integer. So you have to have these two arguments. You provide which operation you want to do on them. Well, OK, that's, that's the same as in here. So that's not a difference. You have to say where the final answer should be stored. So here you say 0 just says stored on process 0. In comreduce in Python, the default is 0. So if you don't specify where you want the answer to be stored, it will just be assumed to be 0, which is convenient. And the uh, MPI com world, that's an explicit argument which has to be given in C. It doesn't have to be given in Python. Python just, the object com will just know what that is. So looking at these two codes, you can see that the Python code is really even though it does exactly the same thing and the number of lines is more or less the same, it is much simpler. It's much more user friendly. It, uh, it's smart enough to figure a lot of things out. You don't have to tell it. You know, in, in C version of MPI reduce, you must have all these arguments. If you miss any of these arguments or if you change the order, your code will just break or it will not compile. Whereas in Python, it's uh, just much simpler. So. Even with MPI, Python has huge advantages in producing simpler code. OK, so let's now look at uh, our uh, code uh, to do the uh, Euler problem in parallel. So here I am still using the Cython module, the find num solutions. As I compiled with Cython before, I didn't have to do any alterations for MPI. I now have to import the MPI for py functions with the import call. And, uh, but now I have to somehow partition the work. So, so what I want to do, of course, is I have a brute force search over various values of parameter P. So I want to split the search up and give each of my processes a portion of the values. So each process will find the maximum value on its subset of possible values of P. And then I want to do a reduction operation. So each process will send its value of 
I, I max to, to, to reduction, which will then find the largest values, larger, largest value, store this in I max global, store this on process zero, then after MPI is shut down, process zero will just print what the I max global is, and that will be the answer. And notice here that I want this to make to, to run a bit longer, so I increase this to n is equal to 5,000. Now there's a question: How do we actually how do I actually distribute uh, these uh, you know the you know the various values of p among processes? So one natural way would be well I could say that let's say let's say if I had only two processes I could say well let process zero handle the first half so from zero to n over two and then the other process handle the other half from n over two to n. But this would be a bad way to distribute things because this function find num solutions, it will actually run much faster for a lower value of i because it has smaller loops to search through than larger values. So if I did that kind of a partitioning where you know I, I just get chunks of this loop given to each process, my parallel program would be unbalanced. Some processes would have much more work to do than other ones and that wouldn't be good from the viewpoint of scaling. So what I instead do is I do this. I just take i modular number of procs, and then if this is equal to the idea of a process, then the process will deal with, uh, that, will attempt that solution. So this is a much more, the load balancing here is much better. So to illustrate if I have eight processes and I am process zero, then I will only deal with cases where I modulo eight is zero. If I'm in process one, I deal with cases where I modulo number of processes one and so on. So this produces an even distribution. Okay, so let's take a look at how this scales. So I have taken here an N equals to 5,000 case. I have timed this on ORCA development node, which has 24 cores. And here's the values. So here I'm increasing the number of processes, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, twenty-four. And here's the time. So on one with one MPI process this took thirty-four seconds, with two eighteen, with four nine point eight eight, and then so on five, three, three. And this is the speed up. So if I take one to be the speed up for a single process, for the serial code, then with two I get one point eight six, which is a little bit short of two, but close. With four, I get 3.47. With eight, I get 5.93. With 16, I get 9.03. And this is, in MPI programs, this is the typical scaling you would see. So ideally, you would want these speed up numbers to be exactly the same as the number of processes number. So that when you, ideally, when you run with 24 processes, it's 24 times faster. What you will typically see in almost all MPI programs is there will be a drop off so that as you, increase the number of processes, you get sort of a linear speed up up to a certain threshold, and then it starts to level off and you're reaching some kind of a plateau, right? And uh, this is dependent on problem size. So this is n equals to 5,000. If I had increased my problem size to uh, n equals to 10,000, this scaling would become much better. Now this is not the fault of Python. This is something inherent in MPI. Part of it has to do with so-called Amdahl's law, where the way these processes work is that not everything in this code is parallelized. There's some operations which are serial, so those, you know, depending on how big a fraction of the code these are, they will, um, you know, they will not be parallelized. So it will lead, lead to a kind of a solid threshold on how much speed up you can get. Okay, so uh, now we reach the final slide. So what is the conclusion? So it is sort of for people who like Python, and you know, th this could be hotly debated. So I, I'm, I hope I'm not, uh, uh, you know, stepping on anybody's toes here. But for people who like Python, this can be a contentious point. But I would say that evidence, at least for me, shows that Python is generally slower than compiled languages like C. But I hope I have shown you that with a bit of effort, you can take a Python code which is a great deal slower and make it only somewhat slower. So you can take a code which is really unusable for, for any kind of a serious calculation and make it for something which is usable. Now, whether you should do this or not and what is acceptable slowdown or not, this is a philosophical point, I guess, or, or it, it's, a, it's a question of strategy. If you are a researcher and you find that uh, you have a choice between writing a code which will take a month versus a code which will take a week. So if, if, if it's your time or your student's time, which is you know, your limiting factor, 
then the fact that the code which takes only a week to write runs three times slower, it might not be a concern, right? On the other hand, if speed matters a lot, then you know you probably have to consider writing in C. But it has to be emphasized that this is maybe this is less drastic than it sounds because you can have a you can have a gradual approach to this problem. So you can write your initial code in Python, write, write it quickly, get the result quickly, ensure that your method works, and then as you move your code to high performance computing, as you give it tougher problems to to work on you can actually start making it faster. One, one possibility I haven't mentioned is that it's, it's quite doable to mix Python and C. So if you write your initial prototype code with Python and, and then you find, okay, I really have to make it run well in an HPC environment, you can locate the function which is the hardest, which takes the most time, and just rewrite that function only in C. So, and this might you make your code sufficiently fast to run. But, you know, rewriting code in another language sort of defeats the purpose of using Python because you lose all the Python advantages. So currently there's a large number of tools to make Python as fast as C and other compiled languages. I have only mentioned Python, but there's other ones. And uh, the goal is definitely to make this problem go away as as much as possible. I think it will never go away because with dynamic typing, if you don't define variables, that's just a fundamental barrier you know, the, in that way, whatever just-in-time compiler you use, it will just not be intelligent enough to, to know what, you know, what numbers you're, what data types you're working with. But things will definitely get better and better on this front.